one of the great ironies is you and I don't talk that often because you're <laughs> crushing it. <laughs> and this is one of the things I train investors, your great investments, you're going to just open up a, an update one day, and it's going to be like, Oh, yeah, we're getting we're about close to 10 million in revenue. And when you invested, they were at two or 3000 a month, which I think is where you were in the accelerator. Yep. And you're gonna be like, Okay, it all worked out. And that <laughs> student in your class, if you will, you know, that Padawan, they just learned how to use a lightsaber, and they crushed it. And then the person you have to deal with constantly is the person who completely <laughs> screws everything up. <laughs> and it's the problem child that take all your time yeah. as an investor um you're the opposite you're that straight a student who just crushes everything this week in startups is brought to you by linkedin marketing to redeem a free 100 dollars linkedin ad credit and launch your first campaign go to linkedin.com slash this week in startups veed makes it super easy for anyone yes you to create great video filled with amazing features like templates auto subtitles, text formatting, auto resizing, a full suite of AI tools, and much more, Veed gives you the tools to engage your audience on any platform. Head to veed.io to start creating incredible video content in minutes. And Finn can't burn its mouth on hot pizza or wave at someone who wasn't waving at them. Finn can resolve half of your customer support tickets instantly before they reach your team. Meet Finn, a breakthrough AI bot by Intercom, ready to join your support team today. Visit intercom.com slash Finn. All right, everybody, welcome back to this week in startups. One of the things we like to do here on the podcast is talk to founders. That's why we called it this week in startups. The show grew over the last 12, 13 years um, to five, six days a week. <laughs> crazy right so much advertising so many topics so many great conversations we started talking about the news a whole bunch and then one of the things i realized is a lot of the companies we've invested in haven't been on the show in a long time and if we invest in a company that means we've got pretty great conviction right because skin in the game we've put money into the company we've placed a bet and so i'm going back through the portfolio i asked the people at our various programs at launch launch is the name of my investment firm you can go to launch.co to see a very modest website Launch four is our fourth fund. What do we do? Uh, and our, what is our fund thesis? We want to be the first fund to invest in a company. And we want to be the first fund to hit 10% ownership in a company, in a winning company, I should say. So let that sink in for a minute. First fund into a company. And it could be one of the first investors. Obviously, you might have some angels, friends and family, the founders themselves might put in money. But as a general driving force, first fund into uh, a startup, and then the first fund to hit 10% in the winning companies. How do we do that? Well, we have Founder University, a 12 week course. Uh, you can go to founder.university, where we meet teams of two or three typically builders who are building an MVP. They might not even be incorporated yet. And we came up with a new idea. We'll give them $25,000. Be their friends and family, their rich uncle, their rich auntie who puts that first 25K in just to pay the legal bills and you know get started pay for some server farms whatever and that's worked out delightfully we've made about 30 of those investments that allows us to start the uh, relationship with a founder and then we have launched accelerator which is a contemporary to y combinator and TechStars. that program puts in 100k for six percent we work with founders for 12 weeks to try to help them refine their pitch and in fact refining your pitch generally means refining your product your customers uh, and and really refining your business at its core because when there's a broken pitch there's typically uh, a broken business model or a broken product and so we work with founders for 12 weeks and then we introduce them to over a thousand investors and hopefully they get 100 to 200 meetings if they get 100 to 200 meetings i in my experience over the last decade of being a fund manager they got a good shot uh, between 100 and 200 meetings and the fact that we've invested they got a good shot at raising a seed round it doesn't always happen uh, sometimes businesses are too uh, avant-garde, too cutting edge, and people don't get it yet. And sometimes maybe investors do get it and they don't see a big enough opportunity. So with all that, uh, here we go back to our knitting at This Week in Startups, talking to the founders that we've invested in now. Ray's company uh, is called iRate. I remember this company coming to our accelerator. Uh, Ray Weisberg, welcome to the program. Have you ever been on This Week in Startups? No, first time. Uh, there we go. So we're doing our job. We're going back through the portfolio. And catching up with our founders uh you came to the 17th cohort of launch accelerator probably in 
2018, 2019? No, 2020. Yeah. 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 Started in 2019 going into 2020. Got it. Um, so when we met, describe what the business was uh, and what your original idea for iRate was. And do you remember us meeting for the first time? I always like to ask yes. that question because I can't remember anything anymore because yeah. I've met so many startups. It blurs into <laughs> one giant podcast slash meeting. Yeah. Um, I can start with the original idea um, for iRate. It was right before we met. The original idea was point of sale reviews on an iPad. It kind of was formed out of a pivot from a Sequoia back startup. My co-founder Michael and I were working at um, terrible business model. We're putting iPads in a business where customers would rate the business and leave. Um, mm. It didn't work. Customers wouldn't go to the iPad. We had a background as service employees. So we sat in these businesses and thought through what it would take to get customers to go to the iPad. And we came up with attaching employee incentives to customer engagement rates. Um, iPad What's an again, example of a business that would do this? Um, companies like Massage Envy, European Wax Center, um, um, Fitness it. Industries. Something where there's a service provider who is representing the business. If you're getting waxed, that person represents the business. That's a pretty intimate, painful, I haven't done it, but from what I understand, or if you're getting your hair cut or you're getting a massage, your experience with that or getting your hair cut your experience with that brand is the person, is it not? Correct. Correct. And they're the face and the voice of the organization. So uh, iPad didn't work. We put it in the cloud, integrated with the point of sale. And what we do is pay service employees to get mentioned in online reviews if customers have great experiences. So, so that um, was the insight was, that was yeah. these service businesses are driven by the Yelp google whatever reviews and i think yelp and google are the top two i guess is that one and two or two and one yeah yeah we uh, stay away from yelp um but google is anytime you're searching for a new business you're going into got a it. google search and you want to show up first got it and so you realized hey they need to get more reviews and they want authentic reviews yep. and the business is occurring between this service provider giving you a haircut giving you a massage uh and the uh customer but they right. don't want to type the review on an ipad at the front desk that is super <laughs> awkward yeah yeah but they might <laughs> one in 10 or one in 50 might want to write a review because they really love their haircut correct correct and they have a solid relationship with the employee and um that was our unique insight we came mm -hmm. from a background of service employees these people are um under recognized uh underpaid but they're the real driving force for the business. They're getting customers to come back. They're increasing sales. They're um, representing the business's brand online. If they give a customer a terrible experience, that customer might go shout out the business in a bad way online. On the flip side, if it's a good experience, they'll mention the business, they'll mention mm -hmm. the staff member and write some great content. Got it. And so this manifests itself how the haircut the person giving the haircut or giving the massage says hey would you consider writing a review where they hand them a card that explains what to do yeah that's one way but we integrate with 50 um, of the leading point of sale companies companies like mind body and the way it works mm -hmm. is imagine you go into massage envy you walk out you get an automated message in real time say hey thank you for your visit please rate your experience with your massage therapist jennifer today if it's a bad experience then we'll filter you back to the business owner where the business owner can chat with that customer, resolve the issue, and then we'll track retention numbers on it. If it's a mm -hmm. good experience, we'll I say, hey, glad you had a good experience. Click here to mention Jennifer by name in an mm -hmm. online review. And each time Jennifer gets mentioned by name, a scraper picks up on it and it pings Jennifer through a mobile app where she can go in, see your review, see your customer feedback, and cash out instantly directly through the app, almost like Venmo. That's fantastic. And uh, you know, when I heard this idea, I immediately said, I don't know how big this can get, but I know that this makes sense to me. And of course, everybody says when they hear, you know, some very um, specific idea like this, oh, maybe it's too niche. Uh, so I think you did get that feedback from a lot of the investors we introduced you through through the accelerator. Is this too niche? And so yep. explain to us how the business has grown over the yeah. years since we invested and I guess we made our investment, you know, back in 2020, it's, it's been now three or four years. So, so how's it yep. gone? I mean, it's gone really well. We're in 4,500 businesses. There's 90,000 employees on the platform. Holy um, cow. Approaching 10 million in revenue. And um, 
last year employees on the platform hit a million dollars earned and this year we are on pace to help employees earn a million dollars um, per month by the end mm. of the year so you know what i loved about your business and i think i talked to you about it at the time was i remember getting pitched on businesses um, or having people back channel to me who had businesses my god there are these pr firms uh, mm. these social marketing firms that have baked accounts on various platforms i'm not going to say which and they've baked you know user review accounts and they will go to a business and they'll write three negative reviews mm -hmm. I literally had this explained to me they'll go in they'll literally go sit outside the business so they can get their ip address close to the business they can do the check-in feature or whatever um they can sort of do some um proximity-based review they write three negative reviews they do it in a really Decked way because they know what mm. reviews will be voted helpful or will resonate and then they will come back to those businesses a couple of months later when they've been impacted by negative reviews and say hey i mm. noticed you have a couple of negative reviews we have a solution for this we have a group of really elite people who we can pitch on writing reviews and uh, we can turn this around and if you give us a thousand bucks and a thousand dollar success fee whatever or give us two thousand dollars a month sign a 12 month contract we can do this this was the state of the business before you got involved and when you got involved i said this seems like a much more aligned with the truth and honesty mm -hmm. if you didn't like your haircut from susan or john there's no way you're going to write a glowing review there's there's nothing in it for the reviewer yeah but if you do like it you are going to write it because, hey, you, you probably appreciate the fact that Susan did such a great job cutting your hair. Yep. And so it worked. And tens of thousands of people are now using it. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Along the way, we've uh, invested a couple times in the company. Uh, so thank you for allowing us to do that. When you're selling to uh, B2B decision makers, they're hard to find, aren't they? When you try to do it on a social network where people are doing dance moves or arguing over Ukraine. That's not where you want to be trying to find B2B decision makers who are in the mindset of making a purchase. No, you want to find those business leaders on LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn has 930 million members ready to do business with you. But what's really important is they have the 180, I'm going to lower my voice here. They have the 180 senior level execs, plus they've got the 10 million C-level execs. That's people like me, the C's, the C-suite. It's so sweet when you can reach the C-suite and LinkedIn's got 10 million of them. Go reach those elite buyers where they live and work all day long. LinkedIn equals business and business equals LinkedIn. It is that simple. And if you've never used LinkedIn for advertising, it's time for you to learn how effective it is. And I want you to learn with a $100 credit from me, your boy, Jake Howe, getting you the hundy so you can get in the game, make B2B marketing everything it can be and get that hundy for your next campaign, go to linkedin.com slash this week in startups to claim that $100 credit. That's linkedin.com slash this week in startups. No spaces, no dashes. Terms and conditions do apply because they've given you a hundy. Talk about how this has grown as a business and what you've mm -hmm. learned. You worked at a startup before this, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, but this was your first essentially venture backed yep. startup. So, what did you learn? From the time you were at our accelerator, not to make this an ad for the accelerator, but just your story of, hey, what did you learn, not just from our accelerator, but just being out there in the field for the last three or four years about developing a product and delighting customers, those two things specifically as granularly as possible. Please. Yeah, uh, like let's start with developing a product. Like for us, we never wanted to build a slightly better reputation uh, management company, a slightly better review company. For us, it was about category design. How do we create a brand new category? We called it employee-driven growth um, mm. and then become king of that category and take market share. So we took our unique product insight on employees earning incentives for getting mentioned in online reviews by customers. And then the whole product roadmap was set up to help employees earn more for growing the businesses they work for. So we developed something called Scoreboard because we have the point of sale data where it's an automated sales competition on the highest revenue generated specific products. Um, the retailer or a brand can set it up and it helps the employees earn more for selling specific products or hitting revenue targets. And it increases revenue for the business 
um, increases earnings for the employee. And if you look at the product roadmap um, now and over time, like, you know, we'll do similar stuff to competitors in the market, but we're always attaching employee earnings to whatever product that is. And it takes a lot of iteration, a lot of prototyping, like we believe in very fast prototyping and tests and killing products that don't work. And we do our best so not that's to- that's product velocity. Yep. Got to run experiments, a little bit of yep. lean startup in there uh, and just moving fast. But creating a category is the thing that I think is the most interesting. You're not copying anything that existed in the world. And so you branded this. You said, hey, this is employee-driven growth. Yep. And so let's talk about how you came to that name slash framing because mm. that framing yep. is so brilliant. It's such a brilliant frame, framing how you look at the world, right? You can yep. look at the world in many different ways for people who don't understand the concept of framing. Framing is a psychological term. And so there's something called attribution theory. You can look at behaviorism and some other schools of psychology. And this is, I was a psych major, it really has helped me in business. But framing and attribution theory is how you attribute things that happen in the world. So if you get caught uh, for speeding on the highway, mm. you could say, I'm an idiot for speeding, be self-loathing. You could say, this cop is corrupt. Uh, these goddamn cops, you can attribute it to them. Or you could attribute it like I do. Hey, ah, I like to go a little bit faster. <laughs> and I'm, that means I'm going to get a speeding ticket every year or two. Therefore, it's a donation because that money goes to my local town or that local town and they probably put it towards education uh, or this cop's not making a ton of money anyway, and they're just doing their job. So I'm free of any pain or suffering. Your framing here is so brilliant because you're saying the employees are driving the growth. And mm -hmm. if you're a business owner, you know this to be true. Mm -hmm. And so if you come in and say, hey, we're an employee uh, driven growth platform. Oh my lord, that just snaps into place for the employer and the employee. Because the employee could yeah. say, uh, you know, oh, yeah, you're right. I, I am the one who drives the growth here. And then the employer could say, I know that you're driving the growth here, and I want to see you get an extra 10 bucks every time you get a great review. And that is that what it averages out to? 10, 20 bucks? That yeah, seems to be um, what I remember. Yeah, if we set it up, it's five dollars. If the business sets, they can do flexible rewards and they mm. can pay employees as much as they want. What's the most a business on. has paid? Um, we have a business that has fifty-one locations um, that is paying out fifty thousand dollars per month to their employees. And, and per review, um, fifty thousand in total. Yeah, per, and then what per review? Yeah, that'd be a that would be a big um, bounty for uh, one review. <laughs> so twenty twenty-five per review. 25 per review. That seems like yep. a really smart business. I'll be totally honest because these reviews are, you know, amazing. So let, let's talk about that framing. When did yep. this land in your consciousness? Was it um, from day one? Because I don't remember hearing this in the accelerator all that much. Mm -hmm. uh, when did when did you click in with this framing of employee driven growth? Um, it's It's been recent. It started um, early on when we're going through the accelerator with our unique insight, the, you know, service background how we differentiated in the market. Um, we got introduced to a book called Play Bigger, um, which really framed this, I think, late last year, and then worked through it with our head of product, Tom Shaw, and we created an internal POV, um, just an internal document that talks about the stakeholders, the employer, the employee, the state that they're in today, how they're wasting all of this money on marketing, how to solve this really tough problem, and then the employee-driven growth philosophy and what happens after that What's the future state we delivered that internally we put it into marketing messages we put it on linkedin into a product we're testing called paypost where our team um posts about employee driven growth and tags irate and earns cash for it um oh, and it sweet. just started to, yeah and it just started taking off we're doing a name brand and a name change and a rebrand that aligns directly with employee driven growth. So that's coming soon and kind of it will help us get out of this like hyper competitive review space. Like we don't want to compete. We want to create a brand new market, take that industry from zero to one and become category king of that. So you market. see this not just being for massage therapists and, and uh, salons and, and hairdressers. It, it could also become something that a venture capital firm could use uh, or a SaaS company could use. For sure, for sure. Uh, for us, we stay hyper focused on a couple industries at a time. Get to critical mass and mm. uh, move on. Right now, the product so setup smart. for 
um, retailers and small businesses. I think in the future there there's possibilities to build for the enterprise. Well, listen, congratulations on all this. The the results speak for themselves. Uh, customers love your product. The uh, employees inside of the company love your product, and I love you, your team and and you guys for allowing us to invest in your company and really come along for the ride. So thank you for letting the Launch Fund and Launch Accelerator participate. Really do appreciate it. Um, you know, and I hope we've been of great service to you when you need our help. One of the great ironies is you and I don't talk that often because you're <laughs> crushing it. <laughs> and this is one of the things I train investors. Your great investments, you're going to just open up a, an update one day and it's going to be like, oh yeah, we're getting we're about close to 10 million in revenue. And when you invested, they were at two or 3,000 a month, which I think is where you were in the accelerator. Yep. And you're going to be like, okay, it all worked out. And that <laughs> student in your class, if you will, you know, that Padawan, they just learned how to use a lightsaber and they crushed it. And then the person you have to deal with constantly is the person who completely <laughs> screws everything up. <laughs> and it's the problem, child, that take all your time yeah. as an investor. Um, you're the opposite. You're that straight A student who just crushes everything. So I'm just really glad that we got to be part of this and the best is yet to come. Listen, I'm doing six podcasts a week. It's not easy. I love doing it. You love listening and we all learn so much. But dealing with video, it is so expensive. It's so time consuming, right? But you want video because videos go viral all day long. How many times does audio go viral? Very rare. I, I, I couldn't even tell you. If you ask me now, tell me the three times vi audio went viral in the last year. I wouldn't have one example for you. But I can tell you a hundred different videos that have gone viral in the past year. So if you want to start leveling up your clips game and make really tight viral clips that will bring you customers, that will build your brand, that'll help you hire people, that will get you venture capital investment, well, you want to use Veed, V-E-E-D. It's a web-based video editor, and it's going to make life easy for you. And the best part, you don't need to have video editing skills. No, Veed has editing features built into it, like auto subtitles, or you can remove background noise, or you can resize it. So you're not sitting there looking up, how do I do this? Uh, how do I use these crazy expensive video editors? Nope, they have all these AI tools that make editing faster and easier, hundreds of plug and play templates and more. Veed lets you do it all without having to spend hours learning complex editing software or paying third parties. So start engaging your audience on any of the major platforms by heading to veed.io and start creating professional quality videos in minutes. That's veed.io to sign up today. Can't wait to see a 10 exit from here, uh, which I guess is going to require a little more capital and mm -hmm. continuing to upgrade that management team and add talent. Yep. Now that you, and I think this is a hard discussion to have. So what, what do you need going forward in terms of your team and experience that, you know, getting from zero to 10 million is one thing, yeah. but you, we, you and I both know 10 million to a hundred million, you're going to need a group of people who've done that jump yep. in all likelihood. I mean, yep. I have seen teams not do that but they they tend to struggle so w what do you need to do as a founder here because you've never run a hundred million dollar company in fact this is your first time running a company that's just about to hit 10 million in revenue yep. so what do you have to do to level this company up and the management team in your mind mm -hmm. yeah really really good question um i think you know one we don't have a marketing function in the company right now that will help <laughs> the sales team is that <laughs> <laughs> we're a marketing platform we don't have anybody doing marketing yeah, i think it gives us a bit of a unique perspective you know why you don't have marketing helpful because <laughs> you have marketing pull you have you have you know you, you know what product market fit is obviously mm -hmm. that's when you know a market and a product you know yep. click in but when you have market pull is what you have you have people who want to use this product and selling it and they just use it more and more you get into 10 locations you're going to go to all 100 if you have 100 locations you're going to go to all a thousand you have market pull so you don't need marketing you know who else had market pull elon mm. with tesla that mm. fucking car was so fantastic sorry you mm. bleeped that out that fucking <laughs> car was so fantastic <laughs> that when i had one i used to tell people want to go for a ride i'll show you all mm. the features and mm. I, I had a talk with elon at one point i was like you should do something like uh, Tesla Rangers or like a Tesla affiliate program. And I take no credit for Elon's work over there, but <laughs> he did obviously create a, uh, he created an affiliate program where people could share, um, that they, uh, you know, their unique URL, uh, after we had yep. that conversation. 
And that worked out really well. Some people wound up getting uh, a lot of credit for selling Model 3s. But my idea was if you had these Rangers, uh, Tesla Rangers, they would go drive the car, Range, right? <laughs> was my yeah. idea. He never did this one. But uh, I said, hey, you could drive the cars somewhere and they uh, would give rides to people. And if that person wound up buying the car, you could give them, you know, whatever, $100 or $500 towards their next car. So I think that's what you have is you may not need a marketing department as much as you need content being created yep. on a regular basis by you and your team to showcase how effective this is and mm. just take a victory lap and give high fives. And, mm. um, but yeah, so marketing is definitely one you need, uh, but it, yeah. you, you should be thoughtful about what it is. I think just explaining what you do mm. is mm. enough. I don't think you have to do hard, a hard sell here. It's just pretty obvious. I think, do you, have you done case studies? That's always a great way yeah. to, the case, yeah. letting customers speak for you, as you know, <laughs> is the greatest re reference, which is literally what you do. So when we do events, um, we ask people to review the Launch Accelerator or Founder University or whatever it is. And we say, can you write us like a three sentence Yelp or a Google review, like review yep. about our business? And then we take those and we'll put it in our marketing. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, marketing. And growth marketing, growth hacking, that's definitely something to build at scale. And that means taking a two-year approach, not just yep. a week, a month-to-month, -month, week to week marketing plan. But I would mm. encourage you to build a two-year marketing plan. What is this marketing team doing in two years? Mm -hmm. You know, what does it look like in two years? If we do yeah. eight quarters and we take a quarter by quarter approach, quarter one, we get this, you know, we get the blogs going, quarter two, we get the case studies going, quarter three, we get our regional report on local business health, whatever it is. And I love what Zillow did. I, I, we hmm. had, um, I had at some point, I'll have the producers look it up. God, this is where I need an AI search engine for the three startups. We had the CMO of Zillow and she was phenomenal. And she was on the, she spoke at a couple of our events. And you remember they did Zestimates and hmm. remember Zillow did reports on local markets and Redfin also did this and yep. they got local news to use the local data. It was such a brilliant move. So the health of the local markets could be like, hey, here is the Reno, here is the Phoenix, uh, you know, or even the Tempe, you know, here is the Austin local business report. And here is how local businesses are doing. Anyway, there's something there around mm -hmm. that. Um, so you think marketing, anything else you think you need to level up finance? Yeah. Sometimes that's hard at a company. Is it time for a CFO? Yeah, well, our COO is running both functions. He's a co founder. Uh -huh. um, uh, eventually, I, I think that's a function we'll need to hire for. Um, I, I really think just finding a, like some executives can scale through the different phases of growth. Um, mm -hmm. It's rare, but finding executives that have gone from 10 to 20, and maybe that's not the same executive that's going to go from 20 to 100. Mm -hmm. And it's painful conversation sometimes. And sometimes people, you know, you're asking them to do almost a, a brand new function at, at that level of scale. So. I think that's important. Um, and then just keeping it candid with the the founding team. I'm just so, I feel mm -hmm. so fortunate to have met um, Michael uh, Arredondo, Mitchell Arredondo, Mike Pieri. I don't know if you remember, but as we we're yeah. going through the accelerator, we were selling to Franchise Health and Beauty and our revenue went to zero for like three mm -hmm. or four months. And we didn't have, we had, you know, barely any cash in the bank. We had a team of 10 or so, and it would have been really easy to to give up then, but we kept it candid um, in a harmonious way, forced each other to level up. And um, I think as we're going through this, like our, the founding team, our number one skill set is just not giving up and not quitting um, and making sure that stays top of mind for the founding team. And then building executives around us that have done it before is really important. I think that radical candor, super important. If you're into uh, radical candor, highly recommend Kim Scott. Uh, mm -hmm. episode of This mm -hmm. Week in Startups, and even better than my interview with her, she did a masterclass, Kim Scott, uh, from Google, and I knew her at a company before Google. Mm -hmm. um, you can uh, go check out her masterclass on Radical Candor, was the name of her book, but she just has a masterclass on tackling the hard conversations with Radical Candor. Mm -hmm. I have a promo code for masterclass they've advertised here, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. So. <laughs> Kim Scott was on episode 965, thanks to my producers. And somebody on my team, please put all these episodes in AI so we can just ask the twist AI. I do think getting a CFO in when you get to towards yep. 10 million is a good idea because uh, respectfully to the COO, um, it, it, how good can you be at operations mm -hmm. and 
uh, you mm -hmm. know, finance with so many hours in the week. And also, yeah. uh, if you think of the bar raising technique, do you know about Amazon's bar raiser concept? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, these interviews are going to become like mini, uh, <laughs> you know, J Cal and founder uh, jam sessions here. Yeah. Go to masterclass.com slash startups to get 15% off. <laughs> I'll put a promo <laughs> on that. <laughs> um, so bar raising, there is an Amazon book, uh, and at Amazon, uh, working backwards is the name of the book. Mm -hmm. And we did a book club on it. I don't know what episode that was, but a bar raiser is somebody you hire. This is one of Bezos's great innovations. Shout out to Jeff Bezos, uh, who just started following me on Twitter. Thanks, Jeff Bezos. Um, a bar raiser is somebody you hire who raises the bar inside your company because they know more mm -hmm. than the existing team. So if you were to hire somebody who, you know, worked at Zillow in the marketing department, obviously they know more than you and I because they did it. If yeah. you were to hire the CFO from Slack or Salesforce or, you know, in the early days, well, they've done it. So therefore they're a bar raiser. And so if you go to um, just do a Google search book club with Jason working backwards, this book is so good in terms of mm -hmm. it changed my thinking. And I don't think we ever I'll put it in the show notes for everybody. If you do a Google search, book club with Jason working backwards. This changed my thinking on a lot of things. Also, they have a right first culture. Have you heard of that before? Right first mm -hmm. culture, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, when they go into meetings, they write, this is the new product or service we're going to do. And they do what's called the six pager. It doesn't have to be six pages, but mm -hmm. they do the internal FAQ, the external FAQ, and they basically have people write down in plain words, not PowerPoints. Mm -hmm. what the plan is and then they will write like a press release that they would give to the press uh or the announcement to users before they build the product why do you do this well mm -hmm. if you can anticipate all the great questions that consumers are going to ask or people internally at the company are going to ask and everybody reads it at the start of a meeting so they have this bizarre weird moment like it's a cult where everybody closes their eyes or turns off their camera and they read ray the the document so everybody's sitting there on their, with their cameras on reading it. It's a thousand words. Okay. It took you six minutes to read it. Everybody takes notes and then everybody asks questions based on what they just read. And you don't go mm. and spend 45 minutes in a PowerPoint deck where everybody's secretly doing their email. It is so transformative. And then I did this when we were launching, we're raising our fourth fund now. You'll be an LP in fund five when you take this company public. <laughs> um, my master plan. Oh, <laughs> people we fund become billionaires and then they invest in our next fund. It's great. Uh, no conflict, no interest. But anyway, um, if you go to launch.co slash memo, I wrote a deal memo hmm. about our fourth fund and our strategy. And this deal memo, when people read it, they understand our strategy. When I walk people through a PowerPoint, they ask me questions that are answered in the first two paragraphs of this. Mm -hmm. And the retention and knowledge of our strategy goes way up when people read. It turns out reading versus watching PowerPoint decks, just complete different. So I really encourage you to do, I would just do this right now. How many yeah. team members you got? Um, close to 60. Holy cow. Just buy working backwards for, I don't know, all 60. Uh, yeah. It'll cost you whatever, 20 bucks per book. You just do the math. <laughs> it's like 1200 bucks or something. And then have a book club one Saturday or one Thursday night, send everybody, uh, you know, an Uber gift card to get pizza or something, and then uh, do a book club and watch the organization level up because Amazon figured out how to have like a very operationally excellent company. All right, mm -hmm. listen, I talked a whole bunch here, but I, I, I'm going to use these segments and I appreciate you being open-minded to doing this. You're the first. I'm using these segments to catch up with my founders, but do like a public jam session with them. Is there anything else we can be helpful with? Uh, you know, as we wrap up here as investors, things that you need, uh, seems like you're in great shape, but if there is, uh, you know, please ask any questions. No, I think I just, so many. no just recommendations, um, like you had there, I think as we're, um, going to the next fundraise, you've been great with intros, um, oh, intros good. through Jackie, um, Jackie are always is super my helpful. intro machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When people, when you, when you get introed, um, just since I have old information here because i don't do all the intros anymore because it's uh, doesn't scale but when you get introed as a launch company where people know that we're on the cap table and we're involved d does it does it help a little bit with the friction or getting meetings for sure for sure like we right. raise the pre-seed through an investor that 
we met during the launch accelerator. We got an intro to them. They didn't invest in our space, so we probably shouldn't have taken the meeting, but they introed us to another investor, a world-class uh-huh. investor that wrote a check really quickly. So Fantastic. it helps a lot. <laughs> How many, when you were doing that seed, I always tell people between 100 and 200 emails to get to 50 to 100 meetings to get to 10 investors, you know, close seven of them. What was your, what was the numbers in that funnel uh, when you, when you raised around? Yes, probably a hundred emails, maybe mm-hmm. twenty meetings, and a, a couple of investors participated. In. Great, amazing! All right, listen. Uh, so proud of the work you've done. Thanks for letting us come along for the ride. Uh, we were one of your first investors, and uh, we'll be with you uh, to the end and and beyond. So <laughs> keep keep grinding. If you need any help, you let us know, and then uh, hopefully come back in a year or two. Uh, we'll get an update on the business, and we'll have a conversation about going from ten to twenty five. Cool. Deal? Appreciate you having us. All right. Thanks, Ray. Finn can't spill coffee on a white shirt or wave at someone who isn't waving at them or burn its mouth on hot pizza. But Finn can resolve half of your customer support tickets instantly before they reach your team. What's Finn? Finn is a breakthrough AI bot from Intercom designed for customer support teams and ready to put other chatbots out of work. It learns your entire knowledge database and has the ability to carry conversations and remember context and nuance while slashing your resolution times and support volume. Meet Finn, a breakthrough AI bot by Intercom, ready to join your support team today. Visit intercom.com slash Finn. All right, next up on the program, everybody, is, you're not going to believe this, we got him back, the one, the only, the transcendent. There can be only one deep tech investor with this track record. Mr. Steve Jurvetson came to Angel Summit. He held court. He shot the long ball, three pointers. He dunked. He mesmerized this audience of 120 or so capital allocators. He's the OG. Invested in SpaceX, Tesla, Hotmail. This guy's been around for a long time. I'm not saying he's old, but he's got that wisdom. He's young at heart with the wisdom of Yoda. VC Yoda, Steve Jurvetson, uninterrupted for the next 30 minutes for you, the loyal This Week in Startups audience. Enjoy. And our next speaker is absolutely extraordinary. We're lucky to have him. It's a legend in the venture industry, original investor in Tesla, SpaceX. So next up, Steve Jurvetson. Well, I'm going to just try in a brief moment to give you an introduction to the way that we invest in disruptive technologies, explain what we mean by that, the origin of where disruption comes from. I'll use space as one example, simply because uh, SpaceX companies like that are very visible. Everyone thinks they know a bit about the business because it's very visceral. When they blow up, it's sort of failure to launch becomes visible. And uh, it's maybe an iconic example of something that very few of us probably thought was a venture investable category, you know, in the 90s, when it was all internet, semiconductors and biotech, and that was pretty much it. And now it's cars, it's agriculture, it's energy, the entire eco uh, sort of economy rather, is opening up to venture uh, investment. That's because it's opening up to entrepreneurial disruption. That's what I want to focus on in the beginning. Just one slide for background and context. These are the kinds of things we invest in. They're all over the map by design, because our filter really is that we try to invest in companies that are unlike anything we've seen before, yet adjacent to where we've been. So it's this ever set of expanding frontiers, now on more domains and, and sectors than ever before. But when we first invested in these companies, they didn't have a product or a prototype, um, and they were generally regarded as impossible ideas. When they succeed, uh, like Tesla or SpaceX, you can see how they've reinvented entire industries, right? The catalytic to change beyond just their uh, direct sales or impact. And we're hoping that'll be the case with others to come, uh, like Commonwealth Fusion and energy space or D-Wave and quantum computing, or even a tie in uh, psychedelic medicine for uh, mental health and try to reinvent an industry that when you look back 20 years, uh, companies that sort of led the tip of the spear of a major sea change. So that's what we look for. Uh, we don't always succeed, of course. Uh, in fact, we fail about half the time. But uh, the filters that we use, uh, I'll explain later in the talk, are ones where we try to look for that ability to find companies for which history books would be written about if they succeed. Companies that have an incredible trajectory looking at 50 or 100 years, not five or 10. Uh, and so we set up our fund to be a 15-year fund. Um, I personally have never sold a share of anything I've invested in. There's some domains of long-term thinking that filter through to the filters we use in the front end that come from the way we structure our work. Okay, meaningful change. So I mentioned that we uh, try to invest in things that are profoundly going to change the world for the better or uh, you know, provocatively are so audacious that history books will be written about them. Right? And I think Tesla and SpaceX will fit into that uh, moniker. I don't know about 
which others, but we're hoping they all have that potential. But how can you even do this? What does it take to have meaningful change? And in every single case, it takes what we would call some form of disruption. It has to be a disruptive innovation or a disruption in a market that's exogenous to the startup itself, right? Without that, the big keep getting bigger, uh, new entrants don't have a chance, and it's just business as usual, right? So in autocracies like China, it, in the long run, I think you're going to see less innovation because you have less new entrants, you have less disruption. When a culture or modality, be it the culture of a region or the culture of a people, doesn't welcome disruptive change, you have less change and you have less innovation. That's what progress is. Now, where does this come from? It's always led by new entrants. This is the only rule of business I believe is inviolate, meaning there is no counterexample in the history of the world. So let me be precise what I'm saying. Take any company that's large or let's say top three in their industry, they will never lead the charge to disrupt that industry. In recent years, that may have seemed strange. You'd be like, well, what about Apple? What about Hewlett Packard? What about Google? And I would all say, no, Google's never going to reinvent search or advertising in the search context until someone else like ChatGP does it to them and they play catch up, right? The same with Apple. They're innovative outside their core, but never in their core business. They haven't done anything laptops or servers for decades, right? Nothing you can point to as an innovation from Apple in what used to be their core business. So big companies can be innovative when they don't innovate in their core, but it is always a new entrant that will change an industry like the automotive industry or the aerospace industry that go decades without a new entrant decades without any change that anyone can point to that's meaningful or disruptive. And then the Teslas and SpaceX lead the change. Now, where does this come from? There are several uh, on this list. I, I won't belabor them. A lot of these are one-offs. Every once in a while, an industry gets privatized. Every once in a while, it gets deregulated. That creates new opportunities, right? Sometimes there's a financial shock. Ironically, big financial swings, black swan events in the economy are great for startups, Right? There was no better time for Tesla to launch its competitive assault in the automotive industry than when all the auto automotive companies were struggling with debt defaults and the possibility of bankruptcy. Right? So Tesla picked up a factory for $42 million that cost a billion dollars of uh, plant uh, property and equipment that was used. Uh, those kind of opportunities are a form of disruption, but you can't necessarily bet on it as a venture investor or an angel investor. Then there's these weird ones, these new channels of distribution. And I would lump the internet and mobility uh, as examples of this. Basically, an entirely new way to mediate interactions with customers, right? Just like Dell was a beneficiary of an entirely new way to ship computers to customers. The same is true for the internet and almost every consumer and business, uh, business you can think of. And same, of course, for all the mobile apps that came. Now, the last one is the one I'm going to focus on. This is the one where I think is the reason we're in the room today. The reason that there are angel investors and venture investors year after year, decade after decade, despite the sporadic but, I mean, no one, I don't think, is focusing on privatization as your investment thesis or deregulation, right? Like, good luck. Where are you going to look around the world for the next one, right? But every single year, you can count on Moore's Law, right? This exponential change in capabilities that, for whatever reason, humans have an impossible time projecting with their linear projection of, um, and, and intu intuition, right? So just like Sony lost the Walkman franchise to MP3 players and just didn't see it coming, how could they not have seen it coming? We just... Every single time, people don't see it coming, whether it's chat GPT or other forms of uh, innovation and disruption today. Quick question. How many people have seen or know of Ray Kurzweil's version of Moore's Law? This is the abstraction of Moore's Law that says the amount of computation that you can buy for a dollar. I only saw one hand. Is that really the case? Wait, hold, keep them up so I can count. Okay, like Steve Martin, what do you do there? Ten. Okay, ten of you. Wow. Okay, so I will explain this slide because I've been updating it from when Kurzweil first published it in 2008. So what you're looking is years on the bottom, how much computation you can buy for a constant dollar, inflation adjusted, which is what people buy, right? No one says, hey, Intel, give me a billion transistors. I'd like to buy some transistors, please, right? They say, I want a certain amount of computation, I want some storage. You could plot either across many different technology stacks. So now this abstraction isn't specific to Intel. It isn't expect, uh, specific to anything Gordon Moore talked about. It isn't specific to the integrated circuit. It's like the analytical engine, the relay-based computer that cracked the Nazi Enigma code, vacuum tube-based computer that predicted Eisenhower's win, et cetera, discrete transistors. Those are different epochs in those gray bands. Well, what Kurzweil realizes astoundingly, if you look at the best price performance computer of the day, it's as if they were on a curve without knowing it, right? It's like spooky. There are other computers below the line. This is the frontier of human capacity to compute. Compounding, uninterrupted, and I'll show you an update to the present day that, can, that covers a 10 billion billion X improvement in price performance computing. And it has nothing to do with Intel, has nothing to do with integrated circuit, has nothing to do with anything we're taught about smaller, better, faster, cheaper, that's unique somehow to the integrated circuit era. It's like kind of spooky, almost cosmological. Why has humanity's capacity to compute 
compounded independence of the economy, World War I, World War II, the Great Depression. You could sort of think metaphorically innovation continues unabated, but this is the driver of everything you just heard about in AI being exciting, in all these industries converting into something new, like Tesla and SpaceX are fundamentally software companies. That is the basis of their competition. It's all driven by this. Now, I've updated this curve for the last, I guess, what would it be, 15 years. And what's kind of astounding is the sea change. Blue would be the traditional compute as we know it, you know, single processor, CPU kind of architectures. Green is NVIDIA. So it would have become obvious, in fact, my mom realized this when I was showing you a slide 13 years ago that she should load up the boat with NVIDIA stock, um, becomes more and more painful, as you, obvious as you go along, that Intel is no longer the harbinger of progress. There is no Intel product for the last 13 years that matters in terms of the frontier of computational capture. More recently, there are custom chips called ASICs that are uh, specialized for AI that are vastly outperforming those NVIDIA chips. NVIDIA continues in green, as you can see, but the yellow and even the weirdest one, this analog chip company called Mythic, it's even closer to a uh, mimic of the human brain as an analog compute architecture that implements uh, AI even more cost, uh, better price performance still. And this is astounding again. When you see a straight line on a curve like this, it's an exponential. Every tick mark on that Y axis is 100x, 100x, 100x. This is a slightly upticking curve. So things like ChatGPT sort of come out of nowhere and seem like magic. Almost everything in the deep learning feels that way initially. Autonomous driving, even Siri in the first few moments until it quickly became annoying. Um, this is going to be our future on ever shorter timescales. So you just heard in an earlier talk, gosh, we live in the most exciting 30-year period ever. But that sliding window just keeps going. The next 10 years will be much more progress than the past 30. The next 20 years will be more progress than the past 100 by this metric alone. And what happens as this goes up is the things that were not simulatable before, like landing a rocket on its legs or the combustion instability in a SpaceX engine, suddenly it can be computed in advance and you can run many more experience, uh, experiments in the simulation domain than you can in physical life. So industries that weren't IT industries start to feel that way, right? Tesla can test billions of virtual miles of driving for the autopilot stack of software before people have driven billions of miles. And that, in a sense, pace change puts the predecessors uh, out of business, right? You can't compete with a software stack if you're do doing a hardware iteration loop. It's the, pay the pace of progress is just that much higher. So what industries have been disrupted by Moore's law? What, the, the reason I belabored that curve was it drives almost everything, right? And almost every inv investment thesis you have, or phrased differently, think of any industry, construction, agriculture, you name it, energy, and say, what will be the basis of competition 20 years from now or 50 years from now? And the answer will almost always be how they process information. It won't be, oh, they had a monopoly on a certain mineral or a patent on a particular composition of matter, right? There, is, there are no patents at SpaceX, or at least there weren't uh, until recently, and, uh, and Tesla open sourced theirs. It's not like there's a thing other than the software stack and the rapid iteration of the learning loop that is the point of differentiation. So in the early days, 90s or so, computing, networking, telecom, kind of obvious, old school, eye-opening for us, and I think a lot of people in the public markets was like, whoa, what's going on in automotive and aerospace? with SpaceX and Tesla. It was kind of a watershed moment. Might this happen to my business? Pick, you know, fill in the blank. And I think it will. I think eventually all industries, we, we, we may be wrong on timing, like five years too early or 10 years too early, as I've sometimes been. Uh, but eventually all these sectors uh, are in various positions of transforming. Uh, and by transforming, I mean, was there a meaningful change you can point to the last 20 years? If not, might there be one coming? And in almost every case there is. So let me use uh, space as just one quick example. These are not, um, and, uh, uh, these are real photos, which is astounding in both cases, right? This isn't like something just made up uh, in ChatGPT. Uh, and it really inspires the next generation of people in this sector. But how did this happen? Like, how did SpaceX come out of nowhere in what is normally a capital intensive business, and still is in some ways, um, to be so profoundly transformative? And might that be a template for others? So the first thing is, there are these things that just worked the first time, like these boosters landing back from the Falcon Heavy in synchrony, as my wife and I saw that took that photo. It's like, holy shit, like that actually worked. Um, or flying the, the DM2 mission with the uh, human astronauts for the first time. There are so many things that depend on the simulation stack. So at SpaceX, they build all their own software. I mean, everything, like even the equivalent of your Salesforce automation system and your SAP, if, you know, and, and, you know and, um, sort of management system for manufacturing. They built the entire software stack. They built their own simulation tools. Instead of using CFD modeling tools, they built their own wavelet based things to predict uh, engine instability and to predict all flights. The point being, and the reason I'm belaboring this is, a lot of this stuff is moved to the software domain of rapid iterations. 
And they were thoughtful about using standard off-the-shelf electronics wherever possible, like the same FPGA control module for almost every control loop in a rocket. It's just different software for, is that a landing leg controller or a stage separation controller? It's just all software. And so having a common hardware reference platform and just off-the-shelf electronics everywhere, nothing proprietary, allows for more rapid iteration cycles. Uh, the analogy that I'd use is kind of like the phone in your pocket. You know the next one's going to look just like the one you currently have physically. Then the one after that's going to look exactly the same. Like it's long ago been that the physical thing became a vessel for code and services. Same for your car. It's the software stack that matters. 20 years from now, you won't buy a car if you buy one at all or ride in one if you choose to ride in one as a service that has the worst autonomous driving stack, right? That will be the singular point of purchase. It'll be an AI purchase decision. It won't matter if that one's got a slightly better battery or slightly better motor. Those will all be commoditized to about the same price point, same you know, componentry price for everyone. There's some dislocations. They don't last decades. 20 years from now, all you care about is a software stack. By the way, at, at SpaceX, everything they make is a fully autonomous vehicle. Every stage of the rocket, booster, upper stage, Dragon Space capsule, both fairings, the boats that go out to sea to retrieve them, every one of those is a fully autonomous vehicle. Now, what impact has this had on market share? This is not to the present day. It's only to 2015. I'll give you an update in a moment. Only focus on the dark blue. America used to have 100% market share in the 80s, meaning if you had a commercial, meaning a free market, you're not like in launching Russian or Chinese military satellites. You're saying, I got a satellite. I could go anywhere. Who's going to launch it for me? It used to be United States. It went to 0% market share for three years in a row, meaning not even U.S. companies would choose a U.S. launch provider because they were not cost competitive. Right? This was the years of cost plus contracting and monopoly consolidation in the industry that made just one monopoly provider fundamentally uh, with a couple of also RANs in the U.S. Enter SpaceX. The change is dramatic. It's rapid. It transforms an industry. It wakes people up. The ministers in China said, we can't compete on price even if we had Western technology because they thought this was an impossible price point of entry. Well, it went further. They now launch huge constellations of satellites at one go. It's a ride share missions, and that's going to get better when these tugs take them to different orbits. But this basically addresses the huge swath of smaller satellites that um, uh, there were 180 uh, venture-backed startups to do small satellite launch vehicles, meaning rockets to just launch small satellites and just that kind of like the Falcon 1 used to do. Well, now you can do several at a go at a much lower price, and that's had a pretty dramatic impact on small satellite launch. So this is not all satellites. They're just the little guys, right? The little Dove satellites, the little 3U CubeSats and things of that sort. The market share has just been growing, um, and it's up about 90% still in 2023 as well. Get a sense of the difference? When we invested in Planet Labs, it was kind of compelling. They, they really showed that you could use commercial off-the-shelf cell phone components, right? Batteries, processors, camera modules, you name it, throw it into a tiny little dove, fly it closer to Earth than the huge Landsat and predecessor things, and be roughly 10,000 times cheaper. Not 10x, not 100x. Think how often the entrepreneur tells you, oh, I got a 10x improvement, or I got a 100x, and you're like, oh, sure you do, right? How about a 1,000? How often do you see a 1,000x in reality? There's so many subcomponents in the aerospace sector that are a 1,000x, it'll make your head spin little, just a stupid little radio to connect to the International Space Station to communicate as you're approaching with the Dragon capsule was a $200,000 radio, a piece of crap analog technology from the 70s, still in use today. You could recreate the whole thing for like 50 bucks in a digital uh, radio, which SpaceX did, of course. That's profound. Now, a next area in space, of course, is once you have lower access, kind of like fiber optics lowered the cost of access to the internet and you have this flourishing of innovations and apps. Similarly, when you lower the cost of access to space, you can do all these huge constellations fly thousands of satellites where you might have had a handful before. And this is pretty game-changing for communications, for positions, navigation, and timing, the equivalent of GPS and things of it the, uh, for figuring out where stuff is, as well as uh, imaging the Earth, not just with the visual bands that we have, but all kinds of new satellites are going to be flying to specifically detect methane, for example, to find all methane leaks on Earth all the time. Like, whoa, that, that, that thing is flaring, was supposed to be flaring, is actually just spewing methane into the air, or this agricultural concern is completely out of control and be able to have feedback on the planet and planetary health. So there can be a lot going on with observing Earth, observing the climate, observing everything, communicating, broadband, direct to phones coming, right? So the next thing beyond these, 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 these dishes is that you're going to go directly to your handset for texting and email anywhere on Earth, right? Without the carriers being involved directly, meaning in other words, you can go direct, you can bypass your government and doing so at, at price points that never been seen before. That's going to bring the next 3 billion people online sooner than most market forecasters had seen. So anyone with a global investment premise in, let's say, the internet might like to think about what does it really mean to have a billion people, 3 billion people over the next three years, being having access to broadband who don't today? What online education courses might they take? How might they want to be part of the global economy? Because they are decoupled from the global economy if they're not on the internet.
That's like a binary switch for like, they're off doing their own thing and hunt you know, sort of a subsistence farming kind of life to they're just as smart and capable. And now they can learn with, let's say, the Khan Academy GPT education system that's personalized to them to be contributing to the global conversation. So I think you're going to see more as a derivative effect, more entrepreneurship than ever before on planet Earth by like a huge amount, just based on headcount. Summary of this, what happened in space? Cheaper access is kind of a disruption. SpaceX's disruption created an opportunity for everyone, right? So from that seminal point, right, in 2009, when the Falcon 1 started flying, and then a bit later with the Falcon, uh, Falcon 1 and the Falcon 9, that's what opened up new space. That's why there's been 300 venture funds that have invested in space in the last five years. Uh, for the first time. Uh, that wouldn't have been a good idea in 2004, right? It, like, it would have been, timing would have been a bit off. So there, that is a catalytic moment. Doing everything in a simulation, right? Having a, iter a rapid iterative loop is in a sense, the single most important factor for a uh, long-term sustainable advantage. Commoditized hardware, like the peace dividends of the cell phone wars between all the different suppliers is the thing that all these new robots, new physical things are using. So even though I hate investing in hardware, I end up investing in things that are vessels for software that are off the shelf hardware and it dematerializes value. One last point about SpaceX before I leave. It's important to have a dream, a vision, something that motivates the employees. Uh, this is of course, making humanity a multi-planetary species for SpaceX. It's making all vehicles electric for, for, um, for Tesla. That gets people excited to come to work each day. It coordinates action as an organization scales. So like a thousand employees may be pulling in different directions if the goal is just maximize profitability. Well, like this quarter, this year, or this decade, right? Those will trade off. Whereas a singular objective that everyone can understand coordinates action as you scale. And it's really an incredible thing to witness. Most of these are sketches. They're not reality. The bottom left is reality. That's headquarters at SpaceX. Every employee walks by this as they go into work each day, reminding them of the prize, Mars, Mars ter terraformed. And it is um, one of the things we look for too in these kinds of companies where there's a dream out on the horizon, let's say 50 years out, that you chain back to the present and say, therefore, we need to invest heavily in reusable rockets because we got to get back from Mars. We got to shift our fuel source from kerosene to methane. Why? Because there's probably no kerosene on Mars and it's easier to make methane, simpler hydrocarbon. So those Mars-based imperatives led SpaceX to invest billions of dollars in things that none of their competitors cared about. And, but most importantly, it led to a competitive advantage here and now. It wasn't just like asteroid mining going underground for 20 years and popping out maybe with a product. It was a better product and service today, terrestrially, with a dream um, simultaneously. So we hold every company that almost impossible um, dual requirement, big audacious change, but iterating with customers in the near term. And we ask ourselves, what is that inevitable future? I'll, I'll say one last thing about forecasting or you know, future ventures being our name. It is much easier to predict something looking out 500 years than five much easier, not just because you won't be around to see if you're wrong or right, right? <laughs> In forecasting, that's the best trick, right? Um, it's that there, you can ignore the transitions, the you know, ways in which big companies will try to regulate around you or unfair business practices and say, in 500 years, will we burn oil and gas in internal combustion engines? Of course not. Will we let humans drive cars around? Of course not. Every vehicle will be autonomous. Every vehicle will be electronic, how, electric. How could it not be, right? How could something not be sustainable? By definition, if it's not sustainable, it's not sustainable. It's like it's tautology, right? And lastly, meat manufacturing. I'll just throw in a completely different one. We won't slaughter animals for food. It's impossible. You can't scale meat consumption the way uh, humanity is wanting to scale it, meaning doubling by the year 2050 with the amount of land on Earth alone, not to mention water use, methane, all the other stuff. So meat is one interesting one. I'll just show one visual. There's lunch companies, a couple here we invested in. It's going to be a taste of the future, if you will. I think we will shift dramatically as a people once we have alternatives that are as good right? That are either cellular ag, meaning growing literally the same stuff that you eat today, or something that is a indistinguishable substitute like that mycelium based steak on the right. The thing that makes this interesting is this organism grows from zero to harvest in 18 hours. So not only are you utilizing all that capital equipment on a daily cycle, you're also running a new experiment every day on taste, texture, and what have you. And so it is already cheaper than you know, beef, it'll soon be cheaper than chicken, and hopefully it'll pave away for a much more sustainable food system in the future. Last thing, why now? And this will be my last slide. Some of you might be wondering, should I be investing into a recession? And because it's not clear, you know, the, uh, the Bureau of Economic Statistics is always lagging by about a year. So we don't really know for anyone yet, but we might be heading into one. Some people think we are. And so for the last 13 years, I've been checking in every three or four years because it keeps changing. The Dow Jones Industrial Average Companies, who are they? And when did they start? And it turns out two thirds of them, strangely, throughout this entire time period, two thirds of them uh, have been started in a recession. And you might ask yourself, why? You know, why are some of the best built to last ginormous companies 
started in recessions more often than not. Um, why the super majority of them? And there were a lot of things that go in their favor. Like, you know, as an investor, you're getting real entrepreneurs, not the arbitrage seeking opportunists who are going to come and go when times are tough. You know, they really care about what they're doing if they're knowingly starting and during a recession. Second is it's easier to build, of course, a team. It's easier to uh, grow, frankly, most importantly, focusing on customers, not investors. So the opposite of this would be, let's say, some soft bank fueled, completely, you know, dizzy, like go chase the next money, get big, quick kinds of schemes, which frankly are really unhealthy for everyone involved, not just the companies that take that capital, but anyone in that sector, right? Imagine you were operating a WeWork-like business model responsibly, right? Life is pretty tough when there's WeWork next to you, right? Now it's taking all the air out of the room. So uh, I like the idea that if you f have a time period where companies are focusing on iterating the learning loop with customers, not focusing on the next round of funding, you build companies that are built to last. And so that's what we look for, frankly, in any market environment, up, down, or sideways. It's not just, oh, let's focus on the next round. It's like, how are we going to iterate and learn from customers more quickly than anyone else? Wow. Incredible, Steve. You had construction on... Um construction listed there as one of those categories and we have we need like seven or eight million more houses in the united states like right now and that seems to be a real sticking point uh and we're in a recession probably it feels like it uh, although they're all unique have you found some exponential technological move moment in construction or in software in construction that could lead to that being an opportunity now? Or is that one where you think, God, we just might still be too early? It feels like one of the mm -hmm. last castles to fall, paradoxically. No, it's a great question. And construction, as some of you may know, is an enormous percentage of global GDP and growing. So as a percent, kind of like healthcare, you know, in the US, it's like, why is it still growing? Labor productivity has gone down over 30 years in the UK and some other markets. It's actually, we're worse off in construction from a labor productivity point of view. It's crazy. So the quick answer is we don't know the answer. We don't feel like, hey, we've got our SpaceX, we found our Tesla. But we do know it's a sector that should change. The uh, indications of inefficiencies, 3% of construction equipment is being used at any given time. It's just sitting around unused 97% of the time. It's insane. Um, so we have invested in software for uh, schedule optimization. But one of the things that can help as a point of entry is to say, how can we do continuous rescheduling based on input changes like COVID interruptions or availability of resources, either labor or a particular piece of equipment, and use that as a gateway into hopefully providing digital efficiencies to what is one of the least digitized industries of all, both agriculture and construction, have the least computerization of anything. I have failed once already. The very first Google X spin out that there was, the very first one was in construction re-engineering. They realized it was you know, one of the biggest economic opportunities on planet Earth. They thought we'd come in from an architecture point of view, like, like this, digitize those architects, like push button generative design for buildings, right? Makes sense. Uh, building codes in every city are different. It turns out we lost all our money there, but it was a fun dream. Um, so the, the quick answer is we know the opportunity is out there. It's a pregnant opportunity, just right for the picking. What we do in cases like this is meet with as many entrepreneurs as we can, look for novelty. Like, is there somebody who is just convinces us they've got the answer and it's unlike anyone else's answer. We have not gotten excited about Back prefab. Back to Mars discussion. Yeah, exactly. So early. not prefab, yeah. not 3D printing, not yeah. a lot of things where there's like scores of companies trying already, but something different. Take one question. So Steve, you mentioned at the end about the hardware commoditization, right? But at the beginning, you also talked about the, the benefits of these custom ASICs, you know, beyond GPUs. So with all these different companies doing their own custom ASICs for better LLMs, how do you, where, where, do, how does the market go? You do you think that that then gets commoditized and not stuck within these individual companies? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, that curve, that Moore's law curve, in a lot of cases, did have hero experiments, not necessarily the highest volume product, right? In in, in some of those, but that has been part of the filter we've used. So, for example, with Mythic, with the analog chip, it's like a forty cent chip. So you could put a neural net in anything. Every security camera, in theory, every Roomba. Cheaper than the plastic buttons on a Roomba could be a voice interface that really understood you, personalized voice that, that worked. <laughs> you know, consider it magic, right? That the voice interface is not like Siri uh, or Alexa. But overall, the general answer to your question is there, it takes some time. So there's a lag before like, every M2 chip from you know, Apple has a neural net you know, engine inside. So they will, the large vendors that sell billions of units, will incorporate and are already those custom ASIC components, right? Every Tesla has custom ASICs in the car and at the data center developed by Tesla. So um, part of our goal as an investor is to try to democratize that a bit more, right? Doing both software and hardware layers that will you know, allow everyone to have that kind of capacity. But you're right that there is a lag. And that's why they invest a lot of money in it, right? Like if there's an opportunity in any arms race to have a computational lead for even just a year or two, it's worth them doing it. Thank you so much, my friend.
That was awesome.